James Hughes' vision of a family gathering in a couple hundred years' time, he projects uh, one member outfitted with gills for living underwater, yet another mod modified for living in a vacuum, but makes the point that all of them will consider themselves to be descendants of the human family. In 50 years, he sees flesh fusing with mechanics and brains and circuits to create some kind of transhuman future. And before you all kind of seize up, he makes the point that eyeglasses are a basic form of transhumanism, not to mention all the knees and hips and implants that we know are out there. James? There is an emerging debate about human enhancement technologies, about how we're going to use technologies like nanotechnology, genetic engineering, uh, psychopharmacology, um, in ways that enhance the human experience, and in ways that allow us to live longer, to become more intelligent, to control our emotions, to uh, experience uh, different kinds of spiritual states, to modify our bodies to fit aesthetic desire. Um, to assure a better life for our children. Um, and that debate has become a, a central passion or an organizing principle for me. It is also a political debate. There are a number of battlefronts on which these issues are being fought, biopolitical issues. Issues about the control of reproduction, issues about the control of the brain, when and how people should have control of their own brains, when we should uh, and control other people's brains. Um, issues about when, when it's appropriate to fix a disability, when it's appropriate to go beyond fixing disabilities to enhance someone. And so people are beginning to uh, find themselves uh, arrayed across an ideological spectrum, which is very different from the ones that we've had before. It's very different from the traditional left-right spectrums we've had before. At one end, at the end that I find myself at, is uh, an emerging ideology called transhumanism. And it's a, an ideology that um, argues that we have the right as individuals to choose to use these products of human reason in ways to go beyond the human experience, the limitations of the human body, the human brain, to become what we can be, to become the fullest that we want to become. One of the issues at play here in the biopolitics is whether humanness is, in fact, the thing on which our rights are based. Some bioconservatives argue this. They argue that humanness starts at conception and ends at, at, uh, at heart death. And transhumanists have a different point of view on this. You can see this humanist debate play out in a number of different human rights documents that have been crafted in different kinds of human rights discourse about whether the human genome, whatever that might be, since we share 30% you know, of our genes with bananas and 99% with the rest of all the creatures on the planet, you know, is it hidden estrus or is it you know, having certain kinds of vocal cords? Or what is it exactly the human genome that we're trying to base our commonness upon? But this notion that the human genome is what we share leads to some kind of characteristic anxieties. And here I'm drawing a parallel between the anxieties around race mixing that we saw in the United States and many other countries um, where taboos were being violated. There are whites, there are blacks, they shouldn't mix. If you mix, terrible things will happen. We won't be able to have a society in which things mix. And here you see the same anxieties. President Bush, uh, in his State of the Union address, most recent State of the Union address, he addressed this. He wants to ban animal-human hybrids. And most people said, what? Uh, Animal-human hybrids, are you, you know, reading too much science fiction? But there are animal-human hybrids. The same week that President Bush said that, an animal-human hybrid that had Down syndrome in a mouse, they had put Down syndrome genes in a mouse, uh, was used to find a potential cure for Down syndrome. So this is the kind of research that uh, President Bush wants to close down, the bioconservatives want to close down, because of their anxieties about the violation of taboo, the violation of boundary. The other kind of theme that emerges out of this racial discourse, this human racial discourse, is that if people go beyond being human, they'll take away your kids' jobs. You won't be able to compete with them in the schools. Our society will fall apart. They'll want to kill you. They'll, they'll be inimical to your interests. We won't be able to hold together as a society. And a number of bioethicists have begun to argue that the outcomes of human enhancement are going to be so frightening and terrible that in this case, this bioethicist George Annis, he argues 
The post-humans will see humans as an inferior subspecies to be enslaved or slaughtered, and it will lead to genetic genocide. And as a consequence, he wants to create uh, a law, an international treaty, that would make human enhancement a crime against humanity, put it in the same category as genocide. In the Western liberal democratic tradition, this is what was fundamental. If you read these original philosophers, Kant and Locke and John Stuart Mill, they weren't protecting humanness. They weren't worried about the human as a category, the natural as a category. What they were interested in was thinking beings, beings who had come up with, out of this floating universe of atoms, come up with the capacity to reflect. And they wanted to see each of those thinking beings have the fullest expression of their capability. They wanted society to support them to become the fullest that they could be. This is what's been fundamental in our tradition. So this leads us to the notion that each individual, it should be central in our current political debate, that each individual should be guaranteed the right to control their own body and brain. Now there's a lot of other rights that need to be in balance, but that should be a central argument. Cognitive liberty, reproductive freedom, bodily autonomy, a central principle. And that a corollary of that is that we have many technologies which enable us to experience the fullest flowering of our abilities. We have healthcare technologies for the disabled. We have healthcare access for, for all of us. There are many struggles that involve giving people access to technology which enables them to become the fullest that they can be. Which is more ageist, to tell someone who's 80 years old, I'm sorry, what's natural now is for you to shuffle off and die, or what's natural now is for you to have the healthiest, most vigorous aging process that we can guarantee through modern technology and through our understanding of the, the aging process. And if, you, if we can guarantee you an extra 20 years, we will do it. We will do what we can, given the other constraints of a society. So there are issues, there are legitimate issues in these technologies. I'm not belittling them. I'm not a techno-utopian. I don't think everything's gonna be okay if we just turn it over to the marketplace. We have to guarantee universal access. We have to make sure that we don't create a two-tiered society, which we already have, a scandalous, scandalously a multi-tiered world of unequal access, where some don't have penicillin and others have organ transplants. We also have to ensure that the technology is safe and universally effective, and we haven't done a very good job of that. But what happens is the bioconservative logic, bioconservative yuck factor short circuit our ability to rationally consider what the options are before us. The bioconservatives say the only thing that we can do is ban these technologies because the future is so scary. And I don't think that that's the legitimate solution. What we need to do is move beyond fear. We need to move to a place of optimism and critical skepticism where we both embrace these technological possibilities and all the benefits that they have to, to give, and we move to the policies that we need. Enhancement technologies are not the problem. Technology has rarely been the problem. Technology creates a new playing field, it creates new problems for society. Those problems still remain greed, ignorance, superstition, hatred, all the things that we've talked about in the course of this conference which need to be addressed. Technology gives us new tools for achieving positive outcomes out of those challenges that we face. But there could be a very bright future if we don't screw it up, if we don't blow each other up, if we don't kill each other. A sexy high-tech vision of a radically democratic future, that's the future I see as possible. And I hope the optimism that I've felt during this conference helps create that future. Thank you.